You know, you never know when people are home on a Sunday or viewing a sermon what they take away. But I talked to my older sister last Sunday afternoon, and she said, it is so good to see you wearing the colors of the Philadelphia Eagles as you preach. That's all she got out of that whole sermon. Thanks, Deb. So today, again, I wear the colors of the Philadelphia Eagles, my hometown team, <laughs> but for good reason, and now I know why. Would you join together as we turn our thoughts and our hearts to this moment? Let us pray. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of each one of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our rock and our salvation. Amen. Ralph Waldo Emerson wrote, Never lose an opportunity of seeing anything as beautiful, for beauty is God's handwriting. In his days at Walden Pond, Emerson would sit still and soak in the beauty all around him. He would talk about perching himself on a pumpkin and believe it was so much more beautiful than being on a velvet cushion with others. Sorry about that. He would be still, and in his stillness, know that the fullness and beauty of God's creation was within him. I was reflecting on Emerson and Walden this week as we went through the frenetic drama of wondering what a groundhog in Pennsylvania would tell us about the halfway point of winter. You know, there's six more weeks of winter as of a few days ago. Now we're closer to the end. But we wait for a groundhog to tell us if it's going to happen or not. Well, I wonder about that. What if we just experienced those last six weeks of winter as beautiful? I'm just saying. If only the groundhog would have walked the area around Walden Pond with, Walt, with Emerson. Perhaps he would have seen the beauty of this season. Perhaps if he had walked the woods of Puxatawney and Young Township, he would have known all that he needed to know about hanging on to winter. Or if he'd come to the wooded pathways around Columbus and taken in the glorious, quiet, snow-covered beauty, he would have had a different microphone in hand. He would have said to the listening world, be present. Be thankful that you have this glorious season and behold God's landscape of love. But as you know, and I should know, groundhogs don't talk. <laughs> when was the last time you read God's handwriting? When was the last time you heard a Godcast instead of a podcast? George Washington Carver said it beautifully, I love to think of nature as an unlimited broadcasting station through which God speaks to us every hour, if only we will tune it in. Everything and everyone have beauty, but not everything and everyone see their beauty, feel their beauty, acknowledge their beauty, experience their beauty. Each of you is beautiful, and each of us is called to acknowledge and feel the beauty that God has placed within us. Not until we are silent, not until we are still, even in this beautiful house of worship, do we see everything and everyone and acknowledge that beauty. So we have to take time to step into the power and purpose of God's presence here in the words of Mother Teresa, spoken from the busy and awful, in many ways, streets of Calcutta, we need to find God, and God cannot be found in noise and restlessness. God is the friend of silence. See how nature, trees, flowers, and grass grows in silence. See the stars and the moon and the sun, how they move in silence. We need silence to be able to touch souls. We of all people, located here on the corner of Cleveland and Broad Streets in Columbus should be attuned to beauty. We're surrounded by beauty here in this space. To our east as well, 
we have the beautiful Museum of Art, which calls us in to see the glorious works of art. To our west, we have the beautiful Social Justice Park, the Washington Gladden Social Justice Park. And west of that and north of that, we have all around us the beauty of art being created by students and teachers at the College of Art and Design. Have you seen our neighbors? I mean, they are sometimes walking art pieces. They are beautiful in every way. They touch me in ways that I can't even explain as I watch them explore the beauty within them and around us. They are truly beautiful, their hands, their hearts. They create beauty in this world. And then we have just to our south, just outside our doors, our sisters and brothers in need of a place to stay, to call home. And across the street, we are blessed with Adam H., which welcomes men and women every day who battle addiction, who battle different challenges of mental health. So around us, outside our doors, we see beauty. And we're surrounded by beauty in our lives if we just pay attention and slow down enough to acknowledge it. Why today am I so concerned about beauty and truth? about restoring beauty in our lives of faith. I draw my inspiration today from Isaiah and Jesus and Paul. They're calling us to behold what is beautiful and to live into beauty's way. The prophet Isaiah is calling us to see what is beautiful and true, and he has his own way of getting to it, if you pay attention. He's calling everyone everywhere all the time to see that we all must be centered in God. While Israel has an elaborate and passionate religion, the prophet and our God are deeply disturbed by what they're seeing in the religious practices that completely disregard the character and intentions that God has in mind. In other words, what is authentic and beautiful in their religion. God and the prophet are concerned that they're missing it. They're concerned that the people are too busy putting on a show with great devotion they're missing the essence of thoughtful prayer, of fasting, and of neighbor engagement with those right at their door. Simply put, in their efforts to look good, they've lost touch with doing good. So beauty comes into focus in Isaiah when those two things come together, when worship and service come together. Like the words chiseled over our door, when, worship, when we enter to worship and depart to serve, that truly is when beauty is known. It comes into focus when beside us and around us those are cared for. Reminds me of a comment that I heard from an Anglican priest years ago while serving in his first parish in Wales. He told of one of his parishioners came to him and said, you know, Father, during communion, you really should turn off the lights so I don't have to see the people around me. She said, I want to be alone when I'm receiving the Eucharist. He reminded her, as only a new rector would do, that communion comes from the French. It means to be in community. And from the Latin, it means fellowship and mutual sharing. And she replied, Father, it's not my problem that the French and the Romans didn't understand what they were talking about. Just turn out the lights. I wonder if she missed what Isaiah was talking about there, trying to draw into community the fullness of worship. Now, Jesus is now past the Beatitudes, and he's into the Sermon on the Mount, speaking of salt and light and fulfillment of law and prophets. He's not worried about things that don't matter. He's pointing to each of us to say, you are salt. You are flavor, you are fullness. You bring out the best in others in this world. He says to others, you are light. You shine on others and you bring to them the fullness of love. That's what he's pointing to. And then when he goes on to talk about Mosaic and Levitical law and the Hebrew prophets, he wants them to follow this. However, I do find this a bit curious. It's almost like he didn't know what he says next in the Sermon on the Mount because he begins to change some of those very laws and show where they break down. Be that as it may, 
we have to know if, he, if, if we follow these words that he's teaching that old time religion has a lot to offer in launching the laws of love and the prophecy of justice. But he's also clear, we can do better. He doesn't say this in a pejorative way. He means it as encouragement for those who are living into the fullness of beautiful relationships with God and with one another. And then our dear Apostle Paul wants us to remember where faith comes from, that faith does not come from elegant speech or the wisdom of human beings, but from God. Faith is a gift from God who points to his son crucified and risen, which scandalizes and offends human wisdom at times. This isn't to say that faith is anti-intellectual and cuts us away from being thinking Christians. That's not what he's saying. He's saying simply that faith is the thing that we turn to when we don't know what to do. Hope is the thing that we turn to that brings all things together. And love, love makes things beautiful. Now, each of us is called to restore beauty in this world. I believe this with my whole heart. Years ago, one of my early teachers and mentors, Father Henry Nowen, wrote these words. The central question is, are the leaders of the present and future truly men and women of God, people with an ardent desire to dwell in God's presence, to listen to God's voice, to look at God's beauty, to touch God's incarnate word and to taste fully God's infinite goodness. I believe we are. Some days we do better than others, but I believe we are. I believe we are people who live in God, who have an ardent desire to dwell in God's presence, to listen to God's voice, to reflect God's beauty, to touch God's incarnate word and to taste and share infinite goodness from God. I believe we are those people that Henry writes about. So let's step into this today. Let us be those who restore beauty in this world. Let us come to the table, the table of beauty, the table of grace, the table of blessing, and let us taste and see the simple and beautiful gifts which God has prepared for us. Amen.